All right, good afternoon, everyone. This is Shelby Hornback with Indiana Hospital Association. We want to thank you for joining us today for the Leadership and Culture Care Transitions webinar. Um, we're really excited to have the Center for Patient Safety on the other line to present to us today. I want to go through a few um, items really quick. First, as, as you are logging on, if you could please chat into the chat box your name and organization for attendance purposes. Um, that would be greatly appreciated. And also, um, if your line is not muted, um, if you could please mute the line while the presentation is going on just to eliminate that background noise, that would be wonderful. And if you have any questions throughout the webinar, feel free to chat that into the chat box. I am monitoring that throughout the whole presentation and we'll let our presenters know of your questions. Um, the last piece of information, I just want to remind you all, and I know um, Tina at the Center for Patient Safety will be speaking to this um, later as well, but our in-person patient safety forums um, are quickly approaching in January, so you should have received an email from me um, last week highlighting the um, location which, with which you can attend for those, um, but I know Tina will go into a little more detail as the presentation continues. Um, so I'm glad um, to, um, to introduce you to Eunice Halverson, who will be presenting uh, this afternoon. Um, Eunice uh, maintains a passion for improving patient safety. As such, in her role as patient safety specialist for the center, she enthusiastically assists organizations to improve their patient safety culture and processes. She also leads the center's patient safety organization program by providing participants with education, data analysis and sharing trends and practices to improve patient safety across the continuum of healthcare. She brings 35 years of leadership and hands-on experience working for a large healthcare system, focusing on patient safety, quality, risk management, performance improvement, and regulatory and accreditation compliance. The last 11 years of her full-time career were spent as corporate vice president for patient safety and quality. As a member of the first healthcare Baldridge recipient, she presented at numerous national, state, and local conferences and meetings. Eunice holds a master's degree in healthcare management services from Webster University and is a Team Steps master trainer. She served as a Malcolm Baldridge examiner for five years and was a member and chair of the overseer board for the Midwest Excellence Institute from 2001 to 2017. Known for her longstanding leadership in patient safety and quality initiatives, she was the recipient of the Missouri Hospital Association's Quality Professional Award in 2008 and the Missouri Governor's Award for Quality by the Excellence in Missouri Foundation in 2009. So with all of that, I want to go ahead and turn it over to Eunice. Eunice, are you there? I am, can you hear me? We can. All right, that's always a good thing. Thank you so much, Shelby. <laughs> I'm humbled by the introduction that you have, I, and welcome to everybody who's on the webinar today. I, I feel your pain as you're living in the quality slash patient safety slash risk, and for those of you in smaller organizations uh, wearing many, many hats, I feel your pain as you're trying to improve patient safety along with everything else, and I don't want you to lose hope. So our goal today is to share some tips, and this is really focusing on the leadership that it takes. And that, this doesn't necessarily mean just your CEO, president, or administrator, um, chief, whomever you are uh, in whichever type of care you're providing. But uh, I worked at SSM Health in St. Louis, Sister Mary Jean, and note the sister, Mary Jean was our CEO for many years. And she had, was of the philosophy that every person in healthcare is a leader. So the message for you today is Take what you can from this. She also told us to, and taught us, to steal shamelessly. So if there's something that you would like from the slides, or there's also a checklist that we're sharing, if there's other information that you would like, I would ask that you would please reach out to the Center for Patient Safety. Um, we are located in Missouri, and you'll see here that our mission is to reduce preventable harm. We had a very long and kind of complicated mission. And last year at our strategy planning meeting, we said, what is it that we really are meant to do? So everything that we do focuses on reducing the preventable harm. And you see our values here, which probably aren't a whole lot different than the values of most healthcare providers. But it's important to us that we, are, uh, that we maintain our integrity 
We focus on the culture of patient safety. That is our main service line. That's, that's what we do is to help organizations across the continuum of care to improve their patient safety work. We work in 43 of the 50 states. Uh, we just are in the process of getting an, another large air, uh, air transportation ambulance um, organization, and they have 40 some bases. And my first question is, ooh, are they in any of those seven states that we haven't done business yet? So we, we look forward to that. So we're very glad to have Indiana on the, on the map with us. We always strive for excellency. Excellence and advocacy is the name of our game. We are advocates for you as providers and we're also advocates for patients. So our objectives today specifically on this webinar is that hopefully you'll have a few tips on how you can integrate patient safety into your strategic plan or your operational plan, whatever you call it. And we'll talk a little bit about those different components and, and how to improve care processes. At the very end, I have five slides that are focusing on how to improve your efficiencies with high reliability. And if we were doing an in-person uh, webinar, we would spend a little bit more time on each of these. Um, again, this is something that is, should be our, our goal, is to become highly reliable like some of the other industries, such as the um, aviation and nuclear medicine industry. But there are healthcare organizations that are becoming uh, very highly, I shouldn't say very, they're becoming more highly reliable. We have more of a challenge because we're not uh, working with widgets. An engine is an engine and it's hard. It's easier to um, make sure that the precision is there for the components of an engine than it is to make sure that those components are there for a body because every single one of us, all the millions of people in the United States and those for which we care, all have little different idiosyncrasies. So the next couple of slides are just going to um, <clears throat> talk a little bit about, and you can use these in sharing, um, in doing your training and teaching in your organization. Why do we put so much focus on patient safety? Well, you know, the IOM report came out in 1999, which is almost 20 years ago. And while it is true that we have made some strides on those things that we have focused, such as reducing um, the, some of the infection rates, uh, there's still a lot of things that are happening. So we, even though our life expectancy with technology has increased lots, and um, although I did hear that last year and this year, the first year that it's gone down, and that's because of the opioids and the, the um, suicides and the, and the drug overdoses, which is a really sad statement. But the bottom line here is that sponges are still being left in patients, and we, we just can't get that right, it seems. So here are some <clears throat> figures for you to, some data for you to share. Um, and I'm sorry that if they're, for the people, for those of you who are from the EMS world that I don't have statistics that are specific to EMS, but we do have some of that too. They're harder to get for the EMS world, uh, but we're be, uh, beginning to uh, collect those because we do work with a lot of EMS uh, organizations too. But the bottom line here is that there are lots of deaths that are caused. Uh, the IOM report said 44 to 98,000. That was 19 years ago. In, in 2016, uh, there was a study the Wall Street Journal per, uh, shared with us that there was up, upward of 200, maybe even 400,000 deaths. But you know, that number doesn't really make any difference because one death, one harm is too much. And it just, it just is so devastating, not only to the patient or the family members, but also to the providers. And it costs us so much money. It's just, it is really a very difficult challenge that we have. This is a very old quote, and, but it's so true for those of you who've been around healthcare as long as I have, um, because medicine used to be very simple and ineffective. And this is kind of fun to talk about what it used to be like, you know, decades ago. And some things were not so good. I mean, doctors and nurses smoked at the, at the nursing stations. And we had cups of coffee that were just sitting there, or other open drinks and things that could have caused problems. And there were people that died. Just think of, of the strides that we have made in, in cancer and curing cancer. And you can take one disease after another and we've made so many strides, but it has become very complex. And with that complexity comes, a lot, comes danger. Kind of like with your electronic records. Um, in the paper world, we had the challenge of being able to write to read the handwriting well now there are other 
problems that we can read the, the, the typing, obviously, in the electronic health record, but there are other problems that we have made for ourselves, such as choosing the wrong patient when uh, entering something or choosing the wrong drug or, you know, just those human errors that we make. So it, we definitely have gone from something that was simpler, but it was less effective. It was maybe safer in some ways. It's more complex and it's potentially dangerous now. We know that uh, the incident reporting system, whatever you use, if it's an electronic system, if it's a paper system, and in some of the lesser uh, developed or, or the, the, the other areas of uh, healthcare that have not really focused on patient safety, they don't even have a process for reporting incidents. But even in those areas, that are, those organizations that are really good reporters, that only about 4% of the incidents, um, there, there's an incident that's reported and this has been found if you do the trigger studies, which they take a lot of time with IHI, the Institute for Health Improvement, which is now with National Patient Safety Foundation. They have several different trigger tools that can, um, you can get information out of the electronic health record, but it takes a lot of work that you have to then go back into the records to see if it really was an, incident, um, an incident or not. So there is a way to get more reporting that's very laborious. So what we'd rather do is to get our, our providers focused on patient safety for them to learn why it's so important to report things and then leaders are responsible obviously to take action on these things. So when you look at the reason, look at that bridge, I, I live outside of St. Louis and I uh, have seen the, the video of the arch being built and it kind of was like this really when they got to the top because they built it from both sides and they had to figure out how to make them match. So that really, it, it really does happen. And unfortunately, when we have errors that occur in healthcare, it's kind of the same way. Um, the majority of them, we don't know why. And we have a lot of at-risk behaviors that we have no explanation for them and we're not addressing them, which obviously um, it, it makes our, our situation a little bit risky. So. Basically, that's the why of why we're looking at patient safety. And there are three main things that leadership is responsible for. And I'm, I'm speaking, these things could apply to other things, but we're just speaking about patient safety today. So we're gonna go through each one of these because leaders, the best thing you can do is lead by example because you set the tone for the culture of your organization. And if the leader is sweeping things under the record, under the, the rug, or if the leader isn't taking action on what's being reported, then others aren't going to report. They're not going to take the time to do it. And that's a spiral downward. Secondly, leaders need to identify what are those goals and use your data, share your data with um, your employees so that the, and your physicians so that they know where you're at. We're not really good at celebrating, so we need to make a plan for celebration and then have an expectation that everybody contributes your patient safety. I know that there are some organizations that even during their evaluations, they ask employees if they have reported any events. And sometimes that can be negative because that means you've made a mistake, you had to report something. But you can focus your reporting on your near misses and it encourage people to report those things that almost happen because we can learn so much from them. The last thing is that leaders need to provide the infrastructure and the accountability. And this includes the resources, the infrastructure for the, the organization. Who, um, that means how are things reported? Um, have you looked at how HR, your personnel department, are handling the events? Because if it's punitive, people aren't going to report things. And then how are uh, employees, how are you communicating with your employees about patient safety? And how are they incentivized? So, we often have discussions about what culture is. And there are many things that contribute to our culture. And it's no different in your safety culture of your organization. So it's made up of a lot of different things, but it's basically the way you look at things, the way you think about things, your attitudes. Um, and some people say it's what happens when the boss isn't here. And so we need to make sure that we're moving towards the positive safety culture. And there's some characteristics that you can really find out. Um, what do we want to do? So, uh, we also have a maturity index. Um, it, it's just a, a table that you can, and if you're interested in that, please let either Shelby or Tina know and we can get that to you. It's a, a, a table that you can look at and it's a great discussion piece that helps you determine 
where are we in our patient safety growth? I talked a little bit about the Institute of Medicine report, and um, they have, there's a lot of information, free by the way, on the AHRQ website. Just ahrq.gov and put in patient safety. You get case studies there. There's all kinds of different information, white papers on patient safety. So I know that resources are a challenge for healthcare organizations, but that's one place where you can get them for free. There's all, there are also resources on our website, but obviously AHR, AHRQ has more than we have. So when you're thinking about your patient safety culture, and this is from the Institute of Medicine, it's just kind of a summary of what they put in their report. But these are the uh, steps that organizations that are really working on improving their patient safety culture need to take. So first of all, a way to identify your errors or some type of surveillance. People need to know what that is. They need to know that it's their responsibility to report and then likely that, I mean, also that you're not going to have a punitive attitude towards that. So uh, we don't get into just culture here but that's something that your organization should be looking at. And we'll talk a little bit more about that when we have the in-person um, meetings in January. Um, and a process improvement. I've taught a lot of process improvement classes in my life, and it's important for your organization to have a process to improve things because when you identify the opportunities, then you put that into a standardized format of how are we gonna take action on that? And then the measurement and being transparent with your results so that your people in your organization know you're doing something about it and know how you are improving. Transparency is one of the characteristics of a, a good patient safety culture, and it's difficult. You, know, you drive down the street or the highway and you see industry that'll have this great big sign outside that says, we've gone X number of days without an employee safety uh, event. And there was a hospital in Southern um, Missouri that a couple years ago, this was an inpatient rehab unit and they went over 120 days, that's over four months without a fall. And that's not a fall with harm, that's without a fall. They had a whole program put in place and they went from the attitude or the culture of, we're an inpatient rehab unit, people are gonna fall because they're here to get stronger, to get better. So and they had a brain injury unit too. And they went from that attitude to not on my shift. And they included the physicians, they included the nurses, obviously, physical therapy, housekeeping, dietary, the patients and their family members in this program. One of the things they did is that they became transparent with their fall statistics. And they also put a sign out at the nursing unit for everybody to see that we have gone X number of days without a fall. And they had many starts where, you know, at first it was one day, one day, one day, because they couldn't, they or one or two, you know, they were having many falls. Um, but the longest that they went was 120 days. And the fall that occurred at that time was a brain injured patient and his wife was with him in the bathroom. She knew she should stay with him, but she left and he fell. And you can imagine how embarrassed and how frustrated she was that she caused that sign to go back down to zero. So just a story of being transparent. So when you think about leadership in Baldridge, they talk about your leadership system. When I started the Baldridge work, I thought, what in the world is a leadership system? When you ask an organization, what is your leadership system? They're, gonna, they're not gonna know what you're talking about. So if you think of your leadership instead of as a set of processes, I think that it helps you to understand. And those who are our leaders, you've gone through a lot of education and training, you have a lot of experience, and you'll see that these six things here are things that probably you're doing all the time, but it's just a good um, reminder. And this comes from uh, Cotter's uh, change management information. So we as leaders are responsible for figuring out what the future is going to be and then inspiring people to make it happen. And driven by our mission, vision, and values, we will align the people and build their commitment and then get the, the obstacles and the barriers out of the way. And lastly, to communicate in our actions more than words, hopefully. If you're not doing uh, rounds that include patient safety, you will include that in your rounds because that really shows that patient safety is important to you. So it's important to engage your frontline staff. Um, and patient safety is not just something that's another program, but it needs to be in your strategic plan. And so when you're, um, this took us a long time to do this because we always had uh, quality indicators, obviously. We had, it started out with just financial and volume 
And then we added satisfaction, that moved to engagement and satisfaction not only of our patients um, slash residents, but also for our employees and that moved to engagement for employees and then also the satisfaction of our uh, medical staff and physicians. But it took a long time to get safety up to elevated up to that same level to be discussed at the executive meetings, the department meetings, and more importantly, the board meetings, but it did work. Once you start taking your safety information to the board meetings, it makes a difference in the culture of your organization. And you can do that confidentially out, confidentially because you're not gonna to wanna to use names. But we found that using pictures of, not, not real pictures of people, but pictures of, of just the body of a person and we would tell stories. Stories are very powerful. And then obviously the board members had to keep that information confidential. But the point of that was, number one, to inform the board members as to what was going on. But number two, to ask for their input. Because some of them, we had like Boeing engineers on our board and they have been doing what we've been doing for a long time. And um, physicians and people who have a lot of information about how to improve patient safety. So important to um, always keep working on building those relationships with your patients and your families and to include them in the discussions. Uh, I recently was a patient in a hospital and I was on two different units. The first unit um, was, I was very impressed. I had a young nurse. Uh, she was just three, four months out of her from graduation or since graduation. Uh, and she was crossing her teeth and dotting her eyes. They did not know that I had worked for SSM um, and what I did as far as patient safety risk, et cetera. Um, but there was such, a, you could tell that she was taking everything um, very seriously about what she was doing. They did bedside report, which was wonderful. I was included in the discussions. I know that some patients are so ill they can't do that, but if family members can uh, be included in that discussion, it would be great. I then was moved to a different unit. They didn't do that, um, and I had had just a taste of having it done, and when they didn't do the bedside reporting, it, I, I noticed that there's a difference in the relationship that you have with the, the providers. So just an FYI of a personal experience there. So a good leader inspires people to have confidence in the leader, but you want to be that great leader to inspire people to have confidence in themselves because they will be able to shine then. These are the characteristics of leadership. And you have to have both of these. You have to be both competent and you have to have the personal characteristics. So um, the competency are the things that you learn, um, mm -hmm. the skills, the behaviors, the knowledge that you have. It's the methods and the tools that are provided by your leaders to do your job. And by the way, having the right tools is just like in, in building something. Um, it, it really makes a difference if we do have the right tools. So pay attention to that. That's where a lot of near misses information can come in uh, handy that people are reporting those things and you find out that your equipment is not up to date. That, and again, if you do something about it, they're gonna keep reporting it and you, you, you want that to happen. I know that financially it's a challenge, but that's where you have to balance this. Uh, how much do we invest and how much um, do we have to wait? Um, on the right-hand side of your screen are the characters and these are the things that you're gonna to want to interview for to make uh, sure that your staff uh, are the appropriate staff that meet the character characteristics of character that you want to have. And again, this is from Steve Covey, and, and I'm sure you've read um, his work. So this just is a really nice graph that's put together um, that, that shows what leadership should be doing. So most important, we model the way, and then we share, we communicate with whatever the vision is of your organization. Always challenging the processes. Those of us who've been around for a while, we might get into this attitude of, well, that's the way it's always been done. We need to challenge that and say, it's always been done that way, but how can we do it better? And then to support and help others to act on it. And always encourage people, you know, healthcare is really hard work. And especially for people who've been involved in a, um, in a harmful event, to support them. Uh, we're gonna talk a little bit about the second victim program, but to make sure that they don't lose heart when things don't go as planned. But then also to make sure that we're celebrating the things that are um, are great. So we need to need to be like athletes because um, athletes have those inherent leader, uh, skills um, and sometimes a, a person has those inherent leadership skills that may not be so good but they can be improved with coaching and practice. I think we all know athletes that didn't start out so good may, might be our own children or relatives but with practice they get better and better 
and to the point that's that's how uh, companies are also so as we work together to improve patient safety we need to be as smooth as that paddle wheel um, always thinking about the complexity and the riskiness healthcare is a very risky or um, a very risky industry so it's important for the leaders to be very committed to that being aware and having discussion with our people to talk about it Frontline leaders, uh, frontline providers have lots of great ideas on how to improve things, but that communication really needs to be there as a commitment and it starts with the top. Make sure that your strategies and your goals are written. Your strategic plan needs to be a written living document, something that's not just on your shelf and patient safety needs to be a part of that. So what does that mean? That means that you're going to look at your data and you're going to figure out what do we need to improve for patient safety? You can't do it all at once, so you might want to use a um, prioritization matrix to figure out what are the things for, it's probably getting a little too late for 2019 if you have a January um, fiscal year, but you know what, it's never too late to, to, start to make improvements. That strategic plan should be living so you can always make changes to it. And the goal is to always improve the care. So once you set your goal, then you figure out how are we going to measure that and if you can, find a comparison for that measurement. You wanna look for benchmark performance if possible. Benchmark means that it's best in class. It's kind of hard in healthcare to find that sometimes, but um, you can just keep searching for that. If you ever have questions about how to find measures in healthcare, just contact me. I'd be more than happy to talk with you about that. Um, I mentioned stories before. They're very important, very powerful. And again, you can change them a little bit or don't, um, don't use the names of patients or providers, but just that's not the point. The point is what happened and then how is it being um, addressed? How is it being improved? And the last one there is the safety culture and taking action on that. And I know that as part of this collaborative, all of you are going to be um, offered the safety culture survey. If you've already done it, you're going to be offered an opportunity to submit your past reports to get a more detailed feedback report from the Center for Patient Safety. So what the, um, we are very firm believers in assessing patient safety culture because that's one way that you can measure your patient safety. Obviously you don't get measurements on an ongoing basis that way, it's usually every 12 to 18 months, but at least you do have a measure that you can use. Um, and it lists, the, the first dot point there lists the different um, dimensions that are evaluated um, and it does provide a focus for improvement because with your feedback report, you get your top opportunities for improvement. You also get your top strengths for uh, celebration as well as some uh, recommendations or some resources that go along with that. There is a staff rating that comes on the patient. That this is the AHRQ one that we use. I don't know about the other ones. There's several different ones out there, but they do ask that the staff members, and this is all the opinions of your staff or your, or your physicians, your providers, but they do ask for those individuals to give you a grade. So while that really is, has some subjectivity, it can be a very meaningful measure as you move from hopefully, uh, let's say that you got a C the first year and you move up from B to A. So you will find that there is a correlation between the increased reporting of events or near misses and your culture scores. Because people become more transparent, they become more trusting. If you've taken the stance that patient safety is important, you, are, you have refined your reporting system and you have encouraged them or maybe even mandated them to use that. We had, our patient safety program was called Always Safe. And as part of Always Safe, we had posters in every department and that included the responsibility, it, it, it included a definition um, of what it meant to be always safe, every day, every way. Um, but it also included the responsibilities of patients and it included the responsibilities of employees and medical staff. And one of those things was to report things. In my departments, I always told people that, you know, that you're not gonna get in trouble for reporting things, but there is going to be a discussion if I find out about things that should have been reported and they weren't reported. And so it's just taking a different twist on things. And again, not in a punitive way, but looking at why was it not reported and how can we do better next time? So you'll see there the, the greatest correlations between your culture scores and the event reporting are in surprise handoffs and transitions, what this collaborative is all about. So as you, um, 
as your patient safety improves, you will find out that your handoff and your tr transition scores will improve also. Teamwork across units. Usually the, the scores for teamwork among you know, within the unit is, is very high. That's what, usually one of the strengths of organizations, especially with healthcare providers. But across units, not so much. And I'm sure we can all have stories of um, Department A blaming Department B for what had happened um, or, or vice versa. Uh, there's also a correlation between the frequency of the events reported. So as I indicated before, as you become stronger in your patient safety culture, your grade hopefully will go up, which is the opinion of, your, um, of the participants. And there is a correlation also with your safety scores and your, your HCAPs, your patient experience in fewer adverse events. Your event numbers reported will go up, but if you look at the harm levels, they will go down. And the difference is, in the past, people have reported things which they knew they had to report because you, know, it, it, you couldn't hide it, so to speak. But now they're reporting things that are near misses or reporting things that there wasn't any harm or reporting things that they didn't think was, they weren't important because nobody was doing anything about it. So once they know that you as leaders are doing something about it, they will report more. Your numbers will go up, but they're also focusing on what's happening so the, the harm goes down. So change management is something that has to occur if we are going to improve our patient safety culture. So our dear friend Hobbs says, once you know things, you start seeing problems everywhere. And once you see problems, you feel like you should fix them, right? And fixing problems always seems to require personal change. And change means that doing things that, and I can't see that because it's the talking thing. Anyway, it's something about, I say fooey to that. So in other words, they're saying, it's going to take a personal change. I'm not going to do that. Well, that's what we don't want to do. We all know this quote about doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results, it's not gonna happen. So we have to change our thinking in order to get a different result. So if we do the same, and this goes on, if we do the same things that we did in the past, we're gonna get the same result and it's not gonna help us. So thinking about culture change, there are a couple of things that, there are two different types of changes. There's the, the adaptive change and there is the technical change. And the technical change, which is on the right-hand side, that one's easier to understand, it's easier to address, and it can be fixed relatively quickly. The adaptive change is changing the culture within your organization. This is the way people think, it's the attitudes they have, the beliefs that they have, the way that they do their work, the way that they interact with one another. And that takes a longer period of time um, to change. So just being aware of that, you can, but you need your technical changes and transparency in order for your cultural changes or your adaptive changes to happen. So that adaptive change, it can be like a pressure cooker. And so the leaders have to make sure that the, the staff members, the providers are in that operating zone, they're productive, and but they're not to the point of being uh, uncomfortable or that they're going to be seeking for a quick fix or, or like the old pressure cooker, it would explode and then you had a problem on your hand. So we have to make sure that we have that balance between how much can our staff take, undertake and how much do we have to just kind of wait and, and do it over time. I mentioned early on that I, these last five slides are um, just for your information about a high reliability organization, HRO. This is where we all want to achieve, want to strive to be here. Um, and this information is not from the healthcare industry. It is from the nuclear medicine and aviation industry, but it applies to healthcare. What I do with these slides and how you can use them if you're interested in um, getting to high reliability is that I take each one of these and we would discuss them at a department meeting and discuss what does that mean to me? And you can get more information on these. You just Google high reliability. Um, Sudcliff, Sudge, Sedgwick and Cliff are the, Sudcliff and Weick, W-E-I-C-K, are the authors of this. And this has been around for quite a while, but it hasn't changed. And um, I take this, each one of these five slides and talk about what does that mean in our department? So preoccupation with failure sounds kind of negative, but that just means that people are focusing on what they're doing and how things could go wrong, how things could break. So if you're doing FMEAs or the failure mode effect analysis, which I know for those of you who are joint commission accredited, you have, you're required to do one. Um, and 
and that was another thing that the, the Boeing engineers got. Are you kidding me? You just do one every year or 18 months. Um, they said they do them all the time. What FMEA does is that you look at your process or you could do this for new equipment. And it's kind of fun because you can figure out how can, what can go wrong and how do we prevent that from happening? So it's moving you from the reactive to the pre preactive. Um, so the preoccupation with failure, you're gonna use a lot of data. You want to get your people to report things and then to use that analysis for patterns and trends. And then for those things that are serious or even for your misses that could be really serious, you wanna do a root cause analysis. And again, reporting back. Have some sort of a library that people can go to for um, references. The second one, again, sounds kind of negative, reluctance to simplify because we think, oh man, let's simplify our lives and it'll be so much better. We have to have those safeguards in our processes, especially in, in healthcare. So this is one of the reasons that we have checklists, one of the reasons that we do timeouts. It would be simpler not to do a timeout for surgery or for a, a procedure. It's the reason that in the back of that ambulance, there's a double check on medications. That makes it a little bit more complex, but it is a safeguard to um, making sure or as possible, as much as possible that we are providing safe care. If something does happen again, having um, the process in place to do the investigation, um, we have uh, action plans that are stronger, medium and weak. Again, that is something that I had a, actually, we called our process improvement, the CQI, Continuous Quality Improvement, which I know is very old, but we, we kept that so it wasn't a flavor of the month and we just added tools to it such as Lean, Six Sigma and Change Management. One of the tools in my kit, and I actually had a toolkit, which was kind of like a, what college students will use to take to their bathroom, you know, one of those plastic holders. That was my CQI toolkit and I had it all decorated. But one of the tools I had in there was a laminated piece of paper that had the actions of stronger actions, weaker actions, and um, the um, moderate actions. Because when we came up with an action plan, we would always check back to make sure that we had, um, that we were putting in place the strongest actions possible. And again, I'd be happy to share that with any, uh, any of you. I know that RCAs at root cause analyses take time, but if you can get to the point that you're doing those more proactively and just not after the case, um, that really is a, a great step in the right direction. The third one is sensitivity to operations. And this means that leaders are sensitive to what's happening in their organizations at all times. So if you are doing rounding, I know many organizations do rounding for staff satisfaction or for patient or customer satisfaction or resident satisfaction, but add some safety questions to that and then make sure that you're gathering that data and reporting back so that your staff can understand and, and see that it is making a difference. I visited a hospital in Idaho uh, and I was helping with their patient safety plan and they had uh, seven days a week at 9 a.m. They had a stand-up meeting. Uh, every department that had anything to do with patients would, was represented in that department. Some of them would call in on the weekends or if they didn't have anybody else. But they would talk about their incidents, what happened, and other things that could improve patient safety. They also had a, a whiteboard that they kept track of what actions need to be taken, and that was also electronic so people could go on their share suite and find it. Excellent, excellent communication. Difficult to do, but time well spent. Make sure that your, your patient safety committee, if you have a patient safety committee, make sure it's multidisciplinary. Um, if you wanna get really um, uh, to the point of having really good patient information, um, invite a patient, and you have to choose this patient very carefully, a patient or their family member to be on your patient safety committee. They obviously have to send a, sign a confidentiality statement. You have to trust that they will not share any of that information, but you can get their perspective. Um, and that brings a lot of, of different information to your, your organization. Unit-based safety coaches are another good resource. Like they take time, but um, the children's hospital in our system did the best job of that where they, and it was a coveted position. It wasn't paid for, but people wanted to be that safety coach. It's kind of like being the cheerleader uh, for patient safety. They would have a luncheon once a month where all the safety coaches would get together and talk about what they've learned, what they're doing, and, and lots of sharing for improvement there. The last one is a difficult and it's a challenge, but the zero tolerance for inappropriate practitioner behavior. And that is, um, it doesn't matter who that is. It's doctors, it's nurses, it's um, paramedics, it's, um, it's any of the, of the providers. 
The fourth one is commitment to resilience. This means that even though something difficult or there has been a situation, you have the flexibility to keep on, um, keep on providing care. Putting patient safety on every leadership meeting agenda, which I have talked about it already, is something that's really important. Look at your job descriptions. Is patient safety um, anywhere in there? And we discussed it at our job evaluations. Being transparent, I think I've um, talked a lot about that, sharing lessons learned, and then um, make sure that the frontline is expected and empowered to respond to system failures. So for instance, for um, timeouts, we, if we had a surgeon who refused to do a timeout, the requirement is that the circulating nurse walked out of the room. Well, they can't do a procedure without the circulating nurse. What happened was that circulating nurse was to call the administrator on call, who had to immediately, that administrator on call was always in the hospital 24 hours um, they were available. They, they weren't necessarily in the hospital 24 hours a day, but they were also always available. They had to talk with that physician. That really made a difference on when the doctors found out that the leaders were serious about this, they, that made a difference. And changing the culture with the medical staff, the best way to do that is to see if you can find one or two physicians who are really interested in improving patient safety and let them be your champions for uh, the medical staff, supporting them all the way, of course. The last one, the last um, characteristic of an HRO is deference to expertise. And this means that employees are, power, are empowered to speak up. It means that you might get more information from the uh, care partner who's been taking care of a patient um, than from the physician because they spend more time with them. Remember to include your patients and your family members as part of the healthcare team. Um, there are lots of free, resources about team steps if that's something we're also going to be talking a little bit about in the, at the january meetings um ahrq that's our government our tax dollars at work they've provided a lot of free information for us um, and we'll talk a little bit about that and we'll also talk a little bit about simulation and the importance i know that at least on the hospital side you have to do the emergency drills and the mock codes but try to do those um, in, to implement uh, simulation in other ways also so in wrapping up, the importance of supporting the patient families. Um, if you have a patient advocate, that's great. Make sure that your disclosure policy and process is very um, defined and the people, the providers know what it means and then supporting your staff and physicians. There's a second victim program out there. We, um, we support that program through the University of, of Missouri twice a year. We offer that uh, to uh, providing organizations across the spectrum of care. And your EAP, of course, can also provide support for those who have been involved in a very difficult situation. So in summary, obviously leadership is the key to improving patient safety. When you get your patient safety culture uh, reports back, you'll have an opportunity to uh, make improvements. Again, making sure that you're transparent and sharing that with your staff. Always work towards getting to that HRO status because that will help you to reduce harm. And key is in supporting your patients and family members and staff to in increase their engagement. Hopefully Shelby was able to upload a checklist that's just the 12 concrete steps to um, four leaders. I'm not gonna go over them, but this is a good checklist for you to see if where you are as far as implement patient, implementing patient safety in your organization. You can download that. There should also be a PDF of our slides that you can download and use for uh, future training in, in your organization. Patient safety is a journey and it does take a lot of effort. It takes a lot of time, but time really is now for us to change and to keep changing and, and keep improving. And it, the uh, patient safety is becoming more and more um, transparent in the media, especially with social media and things are not as hush-hush as they used to be. And so we really do need to make sure that we, we as providers are committed to doing this improvement on patient safety. So here are the three uh, dates in Jan January uh, when the Center for Patient Safety team will be at Park Noble, uh, Decatur County and St. Vincent Clay Hospital. Uh, and we will be, it's the same program at all three places. And this is an adaption of a patient safety boot camp that we, that we offer. And this will be um, with a focus on how you improve your patient safety and some hands-on information. You'll have a lot of time to, we, we do this in TED Talk style. So we give a, present a, a topic in about a 15 or 20 minutes 
and then we have you at discussion tables and you, you talk about and learn from each other uh, how you can improve the different topics that we talk about. So if you will please RSVP so Shelby knows that you're coming, that would be really helpful. Here is my information for any questions. Please reach out to me. You see my um, email is there, ehelverson at centerforpatientsafety.org or the phone number is there. Sorry, I'm on a teleconference. This, this is a picture of our safety team. You see the fourth one. I think we have a little uh, interruption here. The fourth one from the left is Tina, who has been uh, helping to to uh, plan all of your, your collaboration and, and you'll have an opportunity to meet her. Um, Kathy's our attorney on the left hand side, Alex is our executive director, and then Lee Varner is our EMS. Um, we also don't have a picture of Amy Vogelsmeyer, she's uh, an instructor at the University of Missouri. And then we also have, um, just recently, you see not pictured, Shelby Cox is um, a new EMT that we have hired just this summer. So we are very excited to have uh, uh, our team put together. This is Tina's and Kathy's information. They are the project leaders. They can answer questions for you also. And here's a picture of your, your um, Indiana Patient Safety Center team. So with that, I am going to hand it back to Shelby. Uh, we have a few questions, Shelby, that we'd be able to take. We have a few minutes to be able to take some questions if you have any. Great, thank you, Eunice. Um, if you, if anyone has any questions, um, please feel free to chat those into the chat box. Um, and while you're doing that, I don't know, Tina, do you have any more information you want to talk about for the inpatient uh, or in-person patient safety forum? Um, I just think this is a really great opportunity to really meet with your teams and start getting that conversation going uh, in regards to how to get your teams developed. Uh, so I would take advantage of the opportunity <clears throat> for this. And it's really just, um, as Eunice mentioned, it's a great opportunity to have those breakout sessions, to start conversations, to real, real share maybe strengths and weaknesses, um, and to really start that collaboration going face to face. Great, thank you. And um, like I mentioned um, earlier, you should have received an email from me um, um, about the RSVP to the event. If you have not received that email or have um, misplaced it, please let me know. My email is on the screen. Um, Shelby Hornback, please email me and I can provide you with more information. Um, you can also email anyone at the Center for Patient Safety and they will also forward that information on. But please RSVP as soon as possible so we can make sure we have our spaces available. Um, I currently don't see any questions in the chat box. Um, if you have any questions, please feel free to chat those in or some of your lines may be open and if they are, you can also talk through the phone and ask a question. With that then, I say thank you for this opportunity and I look forward to meeting many of you in person next month. Yes, sounds great. And I don't think we have any questions, so we'll go ahead and um, adjourn for today. But thank you all so very much and we wish you safe travels for the holidays. Thank you. I know. Bye-bye.